If you look at the percentage of papers that get more than 100 citations, whether you look in science and engineering or in the social sciences, you're four and a half times as likely to have one of these if you're a part of a team as an individual. And again, this is an N of 24 million. This is all papers ever published. This isn't some small sample. And this is from 2013. If you look at this and think, what causes these teams to do better? One thing is, is teams tend to comp be comprised of people, these best teams of people who've had a lot of citations in the past. That's the blue box. The red box is this atypical combination. So you look and sort of, if I'm citing two papers that haven't been cited in the past together, like a you know, cultural anthropology paper and a game theory paper, that counts as atypical. So that gives you another sort of, think of that as kind of giving you a one time for the citations, a one time for the atypical combinations. And then if you have both, you get this synergy, <laughs> um, which gives you kind of another two times. So if you have atypical combinations and people who get cited a lot, the four kind of comes, one comes from the citations, one comes from the, the uh, citations, one comes from the atypical combinations, and an additional two comes from if you're having both. Yeah. Self-citations. <laughs> you know, no, I, well, I, think it, I, think it, I think it, I think it, I think it does. And also, this understates drastically, the four and a half fold does, because most highly cited single author papers are in annual review pieces and things like that, right? So they're kind of like um, summary papers. So the four and a half is, is very conservative. If you ask what's driving these things, is it content, right? Or is it context? So context being different disciplines, and you look at kind of like novelty percentage and the probability of being a hit. It's really taking things from kind of like different disciplines that seems to matter. Um, so different disciplines matter kind of more content they measure by keywords. The other thing that's a little bit misleading about this is there's two, Dash and Wang did a deeper dive on this. Um, small teams tend to come up with like really cool breakthrough ideas, like teams, you know, this is think of like Kahneman, Tversky, that sort of things, like three or four people. And then big teams tend to develop those things. Right, so there's a difference if you look at kind of like, say this notion of kind of disrupting versus developing and they have ways of measuring that. And what you see is it's the small teams that disrupt and then big things really kind of develop this stuff. The other, I think, fascinating thing about this one, this is just a thing if you're looking at data, I thought they'd throw this out. I don't know if this is published or yet, Dashan just sent me this the other day. But if you look at kind of like, here's diversity on this axis, this is paper to paper citations, patent to paper citations, and patent to patent citations. This is the, this is diversity here. Let's just look up here. This is two years, five years, and ten years. It takes a long things. It takes a while for these things to soak. And so, one of the things when you look at kind of the benefits of diversity, it's probably understated fairly drastically because some of the really because the good the the bigger, more diverse stuff takes longer to, for people to kind of make sense of. Okay. Um, this is a graph of team performance, and what's kind of funny is people say, "Wow, team performance is not normal." Right, it, it seems to be skewed. And as one of my colleagues goes, no, I think team performance looks like this, and these teams all get fired. <laughs> right, so it's, it's a little bit tricky to think about. The teams, there's a massive selection bias in all this data, I put this up, because we're only measuring the teams that didn't like all leave the room, right? So um, there's a survival bias in all of that data we just looked at, okay? Um, there is a question though, um, in this current moment, there's a lot of pressure to find results that say, does demographic diversity, does cognitive diversity, does job related diversity, does, do you get these bigger results as you get the sample size bigger? So this is just a funnel plot, right? So as I'm moving down here, I'm get, I have a smaller study. And if everything lied inside the funnel, you'd be saying we're just publishing noise, right? And this is demographic, cognitive, and job related diversity. This is a meta-analysis of thousands of studies. What you see is no, things lie outside the funnel plot, but what you also see, and this is true, it's also true in the data I showed you from Uzi, there's other people, the best teams are diverse, the worst teams are diverse, right? So when people teach this in business schools, they say, if you want to be mediocre, be homogeneous. If you want to be interesting, be diverse. If you want to fail, be diverse. If you want to be good, be diverse, yeah. yeah. So these things vary a lot, and we'll get, when we get to the, so, Hold that, I'm gonna show you like 10 models and you're gonna see like, oh, if, if the world looks like this, really bad stuff could happen. If the world looks like this, no, it's probably, it's probably not gonna matter. And again, how you measure these things is very, very tricky, right? There's a lot of firm level data on stuff like this that doesn't get published. Like for example, I was talking to someone who works in a, who ran a large um, entertainment company, right? Like think of, you know, someplace in Vegas or Hollywood. And they found that like if on their teams, 
they didn't have both quantitative people and qualitative people, the teams were a wreck. Because like, if you're trying to like, give somebody like, a service and experience, you need people to understand people. But also, at the end of the day, you still got to do things under budget. You know, there's cost associated with things. So you need kind of like quantitative and qualitative. So there's a lot of stuff on that, you know, not anecdotally, but that's held internally by firms. OK. Um, I don't know what's happened here. There we go. If you break this down and you look at the tasks, this is your question. Let me get to you a second. And is the, can I somehow code these tasks as high complex, medium complex, and low complex? And again, this is done by the authors. So there's, like, there's some consistency issues here, right? Nobody's kind of done a measure. Are they measuring complexity the same way? So th this is just scraping. And what you find is overall, um, diversity, you know, does, does diversity do better a little bit? But when you look at just cognitive diversity, right, you see that cognitive diversity does seem to matter on these high tasks. Yeah. The last slide for yeah. demographic diversity, like how fine-grained are the classifications? Is it just like race or is it? This is, again, this is where they're, they're just scraping. So some of these are just they're doing male, female. They're doing race. They're doing culture. They're doing age, right? Another one that they don't put up here, which matters a lot for academic papers, is being from different universities. So just being from, a, uh, Melissa Schilling has work on this, just co-authoring with someone at a different university matters a lot. And the reason why is they just go to different seminars, right? And they're just exposed to different stuff. Like neuroscience last year had like 78,000 papers or something, right? Even if you're in a great department, you're seeing a very thin slice. OK, so um, what I want to do is if I'm putting together a team for a task, then there's this question of how do I select its members? And this is an example of this. This is one of my favorite, favorite students of all time, Andrea Steve. She was brilliant. She gets this job at Amazon, and they said, you're on a team. She tested super high on their like, initial test. Um, you're on a team to figure out how many boxes and what size boxes Amazon should have. <laughs> right? Now, the more boxes, the less you spend on packing costs. And their packing costs that year were $18 billion. So that's three times UCLA's budget. So if you save 1%, you basically save like $180 million. Right? So little step up the hill is good. Um, but if you have too many boxes, you got people sitting around figuring and the robots figuring out which box should I have and stuff like this. And there were breakthrough ideas. Like one was if they made the poster boxes a little longer, you could put three cans of tennis balls inside a poster box and save a ton of money. Like, you know, so, and you think, big deal, that's like a $500,000 idea. So the amazing thing is she's on this team and they do this and they finish. And you know what Amazon did after they finished? They put together a team to figure out how many boxes and what size boxes Amazon should have because the problem changed. This is a complex way or Amazon shifting shipping next year is different when they ship this year. New team. New team, new problem, right? So she went to Google. <laughs> She's like, my work here is done. Okay, so another one is when could a test applied to individuals identify the best team? So what I want to do is I want to have some fun here and we're talking about breakfast about the gravity model. I wrote this book called The Model Thinker, which is just it's a bathroom book about models. It's 28 chapters and each one is kind of a different model, and it's kind of wrapping around it is this idea that to try and understand things, we want to have many, many different models. And when you said the gravity model, part of me died because that's the one model that they cut. Like, you've just gone too far. So the, the gravity model was cut. So I probably... Okay, so here's kind of the simplest team performance function that you can find in business school and organizational behavior textbooks from like the organizational theory textbooks like the 1960s, where you assume the team performance is the sum of individual performance. So this is a northern Michigan logging camp. And when you went to those camps, they'd give you a trial, and they'd see how many trees could you cut down. And team performance is the sum of this. Turns out this isn't true. I asked somebody, I went to a logging camp, and I asked him, they counted their trees, and then they also counted their teeth. Because you, this is growth mindset. Because if you didn't have good teeth, you couldn't kind of eat enough meat to stay healthy to uh, continue to chop down teeth. So it's kind of a verbal and quantitative trees and teeth with the actual uh, score. OK, so there it works, right? Teeth notwithstanding, there is a test. You line them up, hire the people that can chop down the most trees. So if you're small and you're smoking, you don't make the cut. OK, so the next model they have is that, wait, no, teams have coordination. So it's kind of like the sum, but then I can't have too much variance here, right? Wonderful case study out of Harvard Business School. They look at um, rowing teams being example. You want people who are really fast, but they've all got to be kind of moving in sync. And so if you brought in Cam Newton, the famous uh, football player, um, and you thought, like, he's super fast. Should we put him on the team? No, because he'd be, like, too fast to order the team, and it wouldn't work, right? Um, I'm lying here. He actually uh, is slower than them by more than a minute. So, uh, 
somebody bet him if he could be faster than Whitman's team, and the answer was no, not even close. Okay, so in that case, there is no test. In that simple coordination, at least there's no test, because you could have someone who's really fast, and you wouldn't pick them. Okay, example three, this comes from psychology, and this, but I'm going to um, call this unions, and you can think of this, so I've got a type is just a set of things. So like if I'm giving you a test, like I'm just gonna say like, what things do you have? These could be tools, right? These could be knowledge, these could be whatever. I can represent people by sets, and kind of the value of the team is just the union of the set. Now this is a famous um, test in psychology called the alternative uses test or the brick test. So if you wanna ask how creative someone is, you ask them like, what can you do with a brick, right? And you, you can count the uses, you can also count categories of uses. Because it turns out 12-year-old children are really good at this test, but it's just because they can think of lots of things to break. <laughs> the brick. So you know, by category, it's like I can break a chair, break a window, break, you know, whatever, right? Um, there are unbelievably creative answers to this. My, I asked someone in psychology who's run this for 20 years what their favorite was, and they said their favorite, which is very dark, is that you can use it as a coffin in your Barbie and Ken set. Let that one go. Like, don't, don't, don't date that person. <laughs> you know, just let that one go. Okay. That just gives you a sense of, like, I'm guessing no one in here would have thought about that. Oh, wow, I like, have a coffin for my Barbie set. Um, so for fun, I did this. There was a moment a few years back when we realized that plastic straws were the devil's handmaid, right? And we've all stopped using them, and we all feel guilt about it. Every morning I get up and say, I apologize to the earth for using plastic straws. No, I'm serious. This was just not a good thing to do. So I was working with a group of students and people from the business community, I said, okay, let's play the alternative uses test with plastic straws, and here's people's creativity. Right, this is number of uses. But, happy to be here at UCLA, um, Lloyd Shapley would say, well, but the value of each, you know, the value of the team is the union of these things. And if you take the union, there's like, it turns out that's like 113 different answers. And you can figure out Shapley value, which is kind of like, if I'm the only person that had a thing, then I should get a score of one. But if three of us had the idea, what should it be valued at? Well, Shapley says you think of all possible orderings in which people come into the room. Well, if there's three of us, there's a one in three chance that I came in first. So you can kind of Shapley value these things. And if you do this, you find that person F, who had a lot of ideas, actually had a really low Shapley value. So for this test, you basically get, there's no test. For this, for this particular problem, no test. But when we talked to psychologists about this, they said, you know what, guy, there are creative people. And, and, it, uh, and, you can, and if you do the category thing, it kind of works. So now let me, do it, let me do a model of the alternative uses test, where I should thank my colleague Phoebe Ellsworth for this, where there's common and novel answers. So the way this works is as following. Um, there's a set of common uses for the brick or the straw, right, that most people can think of. And then there's idiosyncratic Barbie coffin set things that no one is going to think of. I think there's an infinite set. If every single person has at least K of these, like let's say K equals five or something, and those are random, then if I have a big enough group, the only thing that matters is how many novel uses you have. And so there actually would be a test. The test would be how many novel uses you have, right? So when you are testing creativity, people who use this test in practice, they'll look at kind of how many non-traditional categories of use did you have, right? And that actually is a pretty good, and if you want to put together a team, you want to put together a team of people who had the most kind of non-traditional creative uses, and it kind of works, right? So it's just, you know, it gets subtle, and it gets subtle fast, yeah. Is this like a been validated by, say, like if I'm Amazon, for example, and I'm trying to see if this model works, I maybe hire two teams to do the, the packing task, and then it's shown that teams that generally have larger numbers of novel uses tend to do better at the tasks that they care about? So the alternative uses test has been used a lot, and it was used, when it was first developed, it was used a lot kind of in, you know, by everyone saying, here's a test of creativity, let's put the creative people on the thing, and it, and it as far as I know, I mean, it, again, though, this is, as one of my friends in psychology always likes to say, it's true of me. Of me. No, and the reason it's true of me, Scott Page, is that like, I was an undergrad at the University of Michigan in 1980 when like, most of this, so most of the stuff is true of white people from Michigan and Illinois and Indiana and Carnegie Mellon in the 1970s and 80s. So yeah, for people like me, that's true. 
but I don't know. Like I don't. I don't know if there's been kind of non-weird cross-cultural verifications of how this works. Yeah. So I mean, it's tricky, right? Because teams are typically not engaged in like one-shot activities. Right. In one-shot activities, yeah, you, you definitely want the union of. Of, of uses. Right. But if you want people to communicate with one another, if we're only selecting right. like 10 people with disjoint creative right. outcomes, the right. likelihood that they could communicate is like, you know, zero. <laughs> right. uh, you know, the likelihood that anything that anyone said would be intuitive to anybody else is. So I, it seems to me that this, this, a, this like misses communication theory here. It, it assumes that there's like a, either a, an optimal stacking algorithm and basically zero. Uh, interactions. Yeah, no, so there's a, the, the, the example I cut, and I wish I had to put it in there, so there's, there's an example five of this. I do this thing called the Tom Hanks replacement experiment that plays exactly this. He said, Tom Hanks is, can't do this movie at the last minute. You need to replace him with someone. And, everybody, and, the, and then the, your alternative use of score is how many things did you think of, right? And then we do the Shapley thing. And then I say, okay, now let's write down the list of who everyone has, right? Now can you think of other people? Now what happens is no dudes mention Meryl Streep. All women mention Meryl Streep because Meryl Streep can kind of do anything. Once you say to a guy, Meryl Streep, it's like, oh my goodness, Meryl Streep. And then they can think of all sorts of people. So now if I represented you not as just a set, but as a, net, a full network, and you just happen to like grab a couple regions of your full network, now when somebody points out something over here, I can then riff off that. For example, most white people won't say Denzel but if you look in some sort of actor space in terms of how many movies they've been, their age, their religion, their number of kids, everything, Denzel and Tom Hanks are probably the two cl are incredibly close in some sort of actor space. And once you say ben Denzel, people are like, oh my gosh, they start thinking of you know, black actors, Latino actors, Asian actors, right? And so you can, you can just some basically do- optimal overlap. Yeah, so then, some, right. so then you can basically do an iterative version of this, and then you get an even, and then the test goes away for sure, because you want people who are gonna like, throw you into different parts of your network. Okay, so now that we get this idea for a second, instead of there being a test and no test, we could think individual performance might be a test or there might be some other test, right? Because hidden in all this, like implicit in all this, what I started was the test should somehow be like, how good are you, right? But what we saw in the previous one, it's not how good are you, because you could have come up with all 20 of the common answers, was how many novel answers did you come up with? So the question is like, what might a test be? Yeah. I mean, maybe you should also distinguish between sort of good and bad novel. You know, like there's some pretty bad things you can do with a straw. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. But we, we don't go there. Okay. So that, then the, the ground zero on this is IQ test, right? So there's a set of questions. IQ is kind of the number you get correct, which are possibly weighted. And we talked yesterday about it, or somebody did about the Raven's Progressive Matrix test, right? Um, it turns out an IQ test doesn't even work for a team taking an IQ test. Um, and here's why, let's, so let me just describe two types of people. There's a set of people who do well on IQ tests to get all the easy answers right. There's other people who are just kind of like, maybe not as good at the easy ones, but they can get the hard ones right because they overthink the easy ones. So for any given group of people, and this is a very homogeneous group of people, this is British schoolboys. So they want to get the like, most homogeneous group you could get. Here's your individual IQ score. Here's your contextual IQ, which is are you getting things, more likely to get things right that the other British schoolboys didn't get right? And so it turns out that empirically, an IQ test doesn't even work for an IQ test, which is weird, right? Okay, so now if you look at kind of team IQ, and this is the work by Willie Agarwan Malone, if you look at cognitive tests and measure individual and team ability, it doesn't depend on individual IQ really at all, right? Which seems wrong, and it kind of is wrong. This has been replicated many times. However, this is where, again, you got to look at exactly what they're doing. They were looking with all MIT slow and graduate students looking at a thin slice of the IQ distribution. If I were to take like UCLA and USC people and put them in groups, like obviously the team with more UCLA people would do better, right? No, so I mean, <laughs> giants, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> The um, you know, giant swath of the IQ distribution, right? You're clearly going to do better on average by having people who score higher on IQ. If you're choosing from a narrow range, it doesn't work. So again, this is where when you think about these empirical tests, you've really got to look at carefully what people are doing. Okay, one thing though that did come out of this is that percentage women seem to matter, right? We're thinking what's causing these teams to do better, but then when they look deeper, that didn't matter. I'm tying this back with the stuff we saw yesterday, the eyes in the mind test 
mattered. And women just do better on the eyes and the mind test. And so when you had people take this test, then the coefficient on gender pretty much goes away. But this makes sense, because if you're in a group of people and no one can read anybody's face, like, it's probably not gonna go well. And then you think, ha, wait a minute, this was at MIT, label it a thought, put it away. Right, but there's, they, they might have a larger percentage of people who didn't do as well on the eyes and the mind test. Question? No? Okay, all right. So, back to the show here. Um, what about an ordered IQ test? So, let's suppose that now there's Q questions, PI is the probability of getting problem I correct, and let's suppose it's the case that the minimum score on a harder one, right, the minimum probability is above the maximum score, on an easier one, I'm sorry, the minimum score for someone on question five is higher than the maximum probability of someone at question six right. Right, so five is easier for anybody, than for everybody, than six is for anybody. So now I've got an, just a linear decrease in kind of sets of orders. Now there actually is a high hiring criterion, which is how well did you do on the hardest question? Because if I'm putting together a big team, right, once I get the team big enough, you can make assumptions whether there actually is this weird hiring criterion, which is um, how you did on the hardest one. Yeah. I thought that IQ measures ability to learn rather than intelligence. Am I correct? So there's, there's fluid and crystallized IQ, right? And so fluid is kind of your ability to kind of like solve problems on the fly and crystallize is background knowledge. There's this thing called the Flynn effect where IQ has gone way up. And what we've seen, what you've, what, there's a wonderful paper by Jesse Shapiro on this. Um, it was something called the Flynn effect where IQ has been going up, but it's mostly fluid IQ has gone up. And if you look at, they looked at this, what students are taught in different countries, particularly in Sweden in great detail, we're teaching people a lot more fluid intelligence than we used to. So if you think of this like an economist, like we can teach fluid and crystallized. We used to teach only crystallized. <laughs> we're all memorizing the 50 states, 112 countries, all this sort of stuff, right? And so we were over teaching crystallized and under teaching fluid. Now we're teaching a better balance of fluid and crystallized, and so IQs are going up. Okay, so building from this, and this is work um, with Jonathan Bender at Stanford, but I, I should give full credit to Lee Ross at Stanford and Patrick Winston at MIT, both use this metaphor all the time. So Patrick Winston at MIT would speak at freshman orientation and say when you're coming to MIT, what you're doing is every class you're taking, you're learning sets of tools, and when you leave MIT, you're gonna have a bigger toolbox than you came in with, and what we're teaching you to do is go out and make the world better with those tools. And that was like literally the opening talk of freshman orientation for MIT for a number of years. So you can think of now a set of, there's a set of tools like this, and there's a problem solver is just a set of tools, okay? Well, when we went back and we thought about this and we talked to people who really think about tools and we actually, this is some perspective, like, the, I'm gonna apply tools at a cost, and now I'm gonna think like a game theorist and say, like, I've got personal incentives to kind of get this thing right, but I also want the team to get this thing right, right? Why does that matter? Because it could be that like tool one is most likely to solve it, but I know Jacob's also got tool one, right? But I'm still, I might get in a race with him and try and beat him on tool one. If he's already gonna use tool one, I should use tool four, which isn't as good, but I'm less likely to kind of get the payoff. So it becomes this game here. Now what we realized was in talking to people who study, oh, I seem to have lost power. There we go, there's Patrick with Will I Am. Um, Patrick <laughs> was like, here's a really interesting thing. Take even something like advanced fluid dynamics at Illinois, this is what you cover, and take it at MIT, and this is what you cover. They study windmills at MIT, because they figure if you learn windmills first, then you can learn propellers better, even though it's fluid dynamics. And at Illinois, they teach, um, water going over rocks because Illinois is like in a glacial moraine, right? So something people should learn based on what they're gonna do. So if you actually go down and look at anything, any graduate course at any school, look at the what tools people are learning, you see this kind of tool diversity, which explains the kind of data on why people who went to different schools know different stuff. You kind of get this very micro level, and James has done a lot of work like this as well in terms of what papers are people citing, what tools are they showing. So here's a way to think about this though. So each of these tools has some probability of solving the problem. And we're gonna assume these are kind of like independent, like the generated signals yesterday. And then people have capabilities with the tool. So it's not the case like, 
I now have the calculus, right? <laughs> I may have taken a calculus course, but I may suck, right, at calculus, right? And so now you think, okay, well, obviously here, if this is suddenly now this weird strategic game, I should pick Charlie and Lynette because they're both better. But the thing is, it could be that they're both going to, if this is a game where they've got personal payoffs and collective payoffs, they might both choose tool one. Right? And if you were to pick me instead, I'm not going to choose tool one because I'm not very good at choose, choosing tool one. I'm more likely to choose tool two. And so suddenly when you throw in strategy and differences in ability and stuff like this, all, like, the idea of having a test seems really, really unlikely. Right? Okay. Now we'll get to the last two or three here where it gets kind of more sort of, I think, traditional kind of how we think about problem solving now. You can think of a complex, a difficult problem as a rugged landscape. And as James was mentioning, a complex problem is kind of a shifting landscape. So I'm going to think of a rugged landscape as something that's high dimensional and interdependent. And a problem solver you can think of as a set of heuristics for how they move along that landscape. But I'm also going to talk about them having different perspectives. Because one of the things that's different from people from like... Um, if you think about so evolution solving something, evolution is working on a common perspective, right? Sort of a, a set of genes, whereas humans can decide how we represent things. So in these rugged landscape problems, someone's ability is their expected value. If you kind of set them loose on a problem, what's the expected value of kind of where they get stuck, right? So let me um, do some basic definitions. So a non-rugged landscape is like a Mount Fuji landscape, okay? Now this goes back to, um, Frederick Taylor, who kind of developed the field of scientific management, and he developed something called the, the shovel landscape. So this is a, a test like in my undergraduates, where you look at the, here's the size of the pan of the shovel, right? And here's the efficiency of that shovel for shoveling coal. So if the pan has size zero, that's the technical term for this is stick. It's not very good <laughs> at shoveling, <laughs> right? Now as you make the pan bigger, right? You get more and more efficient, but then if you get to a giant snow shovel, it gets too heavy, and you might as well just have the stick again, right? And so this will give you a Mount Fuji. So this is kind of the funny thing about when, you, when people talk about why complexity has become this big thing, why teams have become a big thing. When Taylor and Ford and the whole kind of, you know, in, and even leading up to kind of the linear programming revolution of dancing and stuff post-World War II, there were a lot of Mount Fujis out there. And until we came up with time study, right, and just basic data collection, we were hanging out over here and hanging out over here and or letting people choose their own subtle side, all, you know, all sorts of stuff, right? So there was a lot of work in scientific management and engineering that was getting people to the peaks of Mount Fuji. But we're, we've kind of left the Mount Fuji era. Um, so what you can think of is instead is we've got these rugged landscapes and local optima is just going to be on one of these things um, a peak, right? So there's nothing tricky there. And you can think of the basins of attraction as depending on like, you know, if I, where I started, if my heuristic was to climb uphill, what's the likelihood? So when you're figuring out what's kind of my expected value, there's early papers that you say, okay, let's just average over the sizes of the peaks, but then you realize that's not quite right because you actually have to look at what's the problem solving heuristic people are using because different heuristics will create different basins. And so you've got to kind of weight these peaks by their basins. So on a rugged landscape problem, my ability is just kind of like, what's my expected value of peak? Okay. That's all good, right? Easy? Okay. Here's where it gets super fun. I was up in Vermont giving a talk, and I met somebody from Ben and Jerry's. like, this is so cool. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm so glad you're happy. They're like, no, no, no. We just did this. I'm like, you just did what? They're like, we just created an ice cream landscape. And then, okay, so now I'm like, this I got to see. By the way, the famous poet Ted Hughes has a poem about ice cream landscapes, which is fantastic. Um, so here's what they did. Ben and Jerry were trying to come up with New York Super Fudge Chunk Ice Cream, and they got a big table. And on this axis was the number of chunks. And on this axis is the size of the chunks, right? So that's their representation of ice cream. So here, there's no genetic code for ice cream. This was like guys with beards in Vermont, how they think about ice cream, right? And so you can think, what's a local optima here? Well, it's a pint of ice cream like this. And they literally used, they said, and we searched to the north, south, east, and west. And I'm like, those are called von Neumann neighborhoods. They're like, oh, that is so cool. <laughs> like, that was just like, it just doesn't get better than like people in Vermont with beards eating ice cream using von Neumann neighborhoods, right? It's like, this is the height of interdisciplinarity. Um, 
So these are their peaks, right? And so you can think of these, these ice cream summits. And now, here's what's really weird. There are hundreds of thousands of people who work as consultants, right? And we all know that consultants are not as smart as Ben and Jerry. They can't be. Ben and Jerry spent their life doing ice cream, right? And these are people who like, were trained at Anderson School or something, right? Um, and so I took the consultants' local optimal. There'd probably be more of them, right? And they'd probably, on average, be lower value. But here's the funny thing. The consultant, who knows how the consultant's going to look at this? So the consultant can say, look, it all comes down to kind of how sweet the ice cream is. So they could create a one-dimensional landscape, right? Um, by caloric rank, and they've got peaks on that. Well, here's what's kind of cool, then. Here's where kind of di perspective diversity starts to matter. Here's their peaks, right? Here's Ben and Jerry's peaks, but let's look at Ben and Jerry. So here's, they found X, and from X they could see Y, but Z is a long way away in their representation. But for the consultants, it could be that Z is right next to X. And Y is a long way away. Because the neighborhood structure depends on how you see, right? What's adjacent depends on how you're representing the problem. So what can happen then is Ben and Jerry, they're like ice cream experts. But from the consultant's perspective, they're sitting here. So the consultant doesn't have to be smarter than Ben and Jerry. In fact, we wouldn't expect the consultant to be better than Ben and Jerry. But what you'd expect them to do is the only way, the way they can add value is if it happens to be the case that given their representation, right, they're able to kind of find something adjacent that they couldn't. So if you look at some consulting companies, like Bain, for instance, is a good example. They had like a set of rubrics that they just would apply to problems. Like, you know, we're just going to look at kind of an 80-20 rule, right, or a 95-5 rule. Like 5% of your products make 95% of your problems. So let's identify those and improve those, right? That's a particular perspective on the firm that the firm probably wasn't using, and if it's very different from the representation that the firm is using, it means your adjacencies are likely to be very different. And you've got a decent chance of adding value. So there is this. So when you think about diversity and problem solving, you could think about using different heuristics. Like you could buy a, I now have to bring in, when I teach my collective intelligence class in my undergrads, I have to bring in the 800 page heuristics for the traveling salesperson problem book. Because I would say there's a book that's this thick with different ways to solve the traveling salesperson problems, and they never believed me. So now I have to like bring it in. And they're like, and they all look through it and go, wow, who does this stuff? You know, um, so that matters. The heuristic diversity matters, but so does this perspective diversity. So now if you look at team performance here, this is pretty straightforward. A solution is a local peak for a team only if it's a local peak for every member of the team. Right? So you're just taking intersections of the peaks. So again, the math here is really simple. Right? You've got a set of peaks, you've got a set of peaks, you've got a set of peaks, I've got a set of peaks. We can only all get stuck if that's a peak for all of us, right? So if you get stuck in A, B, and C. Well, I can propose a move that improves me, but that might hurt everybody else. So that no, we all have the same it. objective function. We're all climbing the same landscape, right? We're all, we're all trying to find, yeah, we're all climbing the same landscape, right? So if the only way we can get stuck at A is if we all get stuck at A, right? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an extremely obvious point. Now, so if you measure individual and team ability by the average driver of local peak, then the team's ability kind of exceeds the ability of any member of the team. Basically, is any local peak for the team has to be a local peak for the individuals. It's a little bit more complicated than this because you've got to take the basin size into account. But you can get an intersection proper. The basin has to get larger as well. So um, you're kind of fine. So basically, teams are better. But then there's another thing that comes out of this that's kind of funny, which is this diversity trumps ability theorem, which I should have the site on there. There we go. Um, if you have teams of diverse problem solvers, they're going to outperform a team of the highest of people of the highest individuality if the problem's hard, the team size are modest, and the population you're drawing from is sufficiently diverse and large. So if I got a whole bunch of people I'm choosing from, it's pretty diverse. I'm picking a moderately sized team. Not only will the picking the best not give you the best team, but picking kind of like random people who are above a threshold will do better. And the reason why is this: is think of there being a space of problem solvers, right? So now let's think of a, la a landscape of problem solvers. So these are problem solvers, not the problem. So suppose I just can somehow represent them in a one-dimensional space. Here's kind of the best problem solver. If the problem is hard, the best problem solver doesn't solve it. Well, if I'm picking from a large population and I take like the best, if I choose a large sample and then take the best 20, they're all going to lie kind of in a neighborhood. Most are going to lie in a neighborhood of this. Maybe I get one person over here. But they're going to be close in problem solver space. 
So if they're close in problem solver space, and if I'm representing this problem solver space by what are your local optima, I'm getting a whole bunch of people with similar local optima. So basically take, create a metric space over the local optima, use that as a distance function here, right? And if I draw enough people, I'm gonna get people who think about the problem the same way, right? This comes up, you know, it's funny, that you think, who would think this? But like, because of this work, I'll go give talks to places like the Federal Reserve, the IMF, the World Bank, and places like that, and they'll be like, 70 people who all went to four schools, <laughs> you know, who are all, like, all trained in the same way. We were joking about this yesterday. I was at the New York Fed, and they were like, yeah, we, our China person quit six months ago. And so it's like, wait, you're deciding monetary policy with no one who studied China. It's okay, we've got someone from Wharton. I mean, like, no, right? I mean, it's just like, no. And it's even worse than that when you go to, like, the World Bank and the IMF. Most of their teams are all people who went to the same school. So it's all Kyoto people, all LSE people, all Wharton people, right? Which just, I mean, they've, they've got the same, t and, and why, and you're thinking, why do they think that? It's because they have this kind of merit of like the best people went to MIT, right? Okay, so the highest of people are near each other in space, the best are similar. Once you get a large enough team, right, you're gonna get people near the peak, and if I'm drawing random people, I'm getting random, more random people in the space and I'll do better. Okay, example nine, this is one of my favorites. Because this guy, um, Leandro Marcolini, wrote me a paper saying, that paper is wrong. That can't be true. Like, the best teams consist of the smartest people. And he's like, I want to, like, come work with you and show it's not true. And I said, well, I'm probably the wrong person. Not that I'm, like, not looking, but I'm probably by, work with somebody else on this, right? But, like, but you should definitely do this. So he worked with Milan Tambay, who used to be not at USC. Now he's at Harvard. Once, once Harvard decided that computer science was a field, they hired him. <laughs> Here's what they did. They said, we're going to have algorithms that play Go. We're going to construct a bunch of algorithms that play Go. And then have team seven, I mean, have teams of size seven where the algorithms just, just vote on where to move and go. Okay? And so then here's, the, here's his thesis. Take the best seven and compare those to a diverse team. Right? So the best ones are more likely to make the correct move each time and the diverse team this. And the result that he was going to find is the best seven will win, right? Unfortunately for him, that did not work, right? The best seven lost. And here's what's going on. When you have, suppose this is the correct move, and I've got these best seven. The best seven were all very similar. And so you got a bunch of votes like this. Like three of them would vote for the, what? The best of, like all the moves on the table, this is the best move. All other moves on the table. Well, relative, I mean, relative to all possible games that can be played. Yeah, yeah let's suppose that you get, what? Yeah, yeah, no, but, but there, the, the hype is a thought experiment. Suppose that's the best move. Suppose that's the best move the algorithms could think of, right? Okay. And this is an incorrect, this is a bad move. If the algorithms are similar, it became, it was the votes for the best seven, there were a lot of like four, three votes. Right? When they had the diverse team, <laughs> here's what it would look like. There were a lot of like two one 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 votes. Right? Because they were so different. Right? So there were like two people voted for this, and then there's a whole bunch of idiosyncratic votes. And yeah. if, you, if you play games like this, you, you know that um, you cannot think of one move ahead, right? I mean, of course, you're Super expert will propose something where he's thinking of a sure. you know ten ten game sequence, right? Mm -hmm. And then if somebody proposes a near a different ten game sequence, that, that just falls apart. Absolutely. So uh, I'm not quite sure if this is fair in some sense. I mean, he chose this in some ways so that it would be unfair, so that the homogeneous team would do better because they're all very similar. So they they had similar. No, no, but what I'm just saying is that it's clear why a homogeneous team would not do better because. The, they are actually proposing move one of a 10-move sequence. So I propose move one of a right. clever 10-move yeah, yeah. sequence. We do the same, and then, of course, when we try to average this, we get nonsense, because we're averaging something that's not even apparent. No, but you're, not, but you're, you're doing a majority vote. No, I understand, but what I'm saying is that you split votes in the, in the result, and then you... you yeah, but, 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 here's, but, but I think he, he chose this game because he, for exactly this reason, right? So it's a great point you're raising. His, he chose this game because he thought, okay, in Go, you are doing a sequence of strategies. And so if I have a bunch of strategies that are similar, they're thinking in the same way, so their sequences make sense. If I have strategies that are dissimilar, once this person moves me over here, like if I move over here, that wasn't what I was thinking at all, so they have, they have very different plans, right? Maybe 
that this agreement is that where if you think very similarly, you'll have different plans. I'm sorry, what? Where if people think very similarly, over 10 moves, you might still have very different plans. Right? Okay. It's hard to come up with the same plan. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that, this, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go to a deep dive on Go here. I want to keep, let's, let's, let's um, the point is, let's suppose this move is better than this move. It could be that, like, by, by almost any objective measure, the thing is, these algorithms aren't perfect. So if you have a bunch of similar algorithms, they're going to make a, cor they're likely to make a correlated mistake. Right? They could all make the same kind of, like, think of red as a bad move, right? You look dubious. I just don't understand how a clever algorithm would propose a bad move, unless it's thinking about some interesting follow-up sure. that then gets obscured because of the majority not seeing that genius continuation to the bad move. Well, so suppose they're, they're playing against a particular opponent, so it's making assumptions about what that opponent's going to do. So this move, it, th it thinks it's a good move because it thinks what that opponent's going to do, and the opponent's not going to do that. So then it's up being a bad move. Yeah. This be part of the evaluation. Yeah. That's the the committee of drivers on agents do better than just one clever agent. Yeah. In this one, yeah. Um, all right, let's set this aside. Let's just think of the logic of what's going on here. The logic is there's uncorrelated air. So if you think of there being a, a suppose there's a, a very good move, and, there's, and sometimes these things come up with bad moves, if the algorithms are diverse, they're making very different, throwing up very different bad alternatives. They're really unlikely to um, choose the same bad move. If I have seven people looking at the problem in a very different way, with very diverse outcomes, it's really unlikely on a Go board that we would choose the same wrong square, bad square. So, so what you're saying is that a team is less likely to do something stupid than an individual, even if it's a strong, right? Well, a team, but, but the, even Richard, what he's saying, what they're saying in this paper is that, like, if you're all using, if you're using algorithms from the same class, like, there's, you know, there's no free lunch theorems, things like that, no algorithm works well in all classes of problems, and no algorithm is going to work well against all opponents. So algorithms, because they're finite, are going to make some mistakes. If your algorithms are similar, the mistakes they make are going to be highly correlated, right? And so it's just as if it's one person, as if, if it's as if one person making a mistake. Whereas here, if they're diverse, right, there may be more mis I've got more mistakes here in the other case because I'm assuming they're not as smart. Even though they make more mistakes, because they're very different, they're making different mistakes. Right? I, I see the logic, but experience. I mean, we, you can, okay, we can, yeah, okay, right. We can, all right, we can read the paper. But I mean, the thing is, this is, this is what happens in the paper. Well, it's a model and it's a paper, right? I mean, it's a, I mean, they did, this is what happened. Yes, they did this experiment and this is what happened. Right? I mean, all I'm saying is this is what happened. We can argue about whether it happened or not, but it happened, right? Cats were eaten. Okay, so <laughs> there's cardinal problem solving here. Here's, this is a paper by uh, John Kleinberg and Mitha Raghu where they said, okay, after the Tom Bay paper came out and um, Lou and my paper, they, John was like, let me see if we can come about this more like a statistician would think about this and think about a problem solver as being a distribution. So like when, when I bring James into the room, I'm, I'm going to be some distribution of possible things. So I'm putting some randomness in here. And then the team is just some function of the distribution. So it's kind of an expected value across those distributions somehow. And someone's individual ability is kind of the expected value of their distribution. And then the question is, could there be a test? And it turns out, it's kind of like, unless it's additive, right, the best team is not the highest ability people. But what they find, which is really fascinating, is for a max problem, if you're trying to find like the very best answer, then how a team of only your type does can be an approximate test. Now, this actually turns out to be a result that Weitzman had in the 1970s about like, if you're trying to get a good answer, you don't choose from the distribution of the highest mean, you choose someone that has higher variance, right? If you get multiple draws. So all this is doing is saying, if I want to get the best answer, I care kind of about the max as opposed to the mean. And so a team of people, I could, you get this kind of, there's an approximate test. Okay, so talking to John and Meister at length, we said, okay, there's got to be an axiomatic proof here sometime at some point. And 
John's like, yeah, but I'm a computer scientist. We don't do axiomatic proofs, so why don't you guys do it? So here's the axiomatic framework. Let's just suppose there's types of problem solvers. They could be sets. They could be distributions. They could be whatever. There's just some, you can make it finite. You can make it infinite. It doesn't matter. And there's a value function that is indexed by team size. So if I have a team of size k, there's a value function of size k. So any problem has a value function of size k, a value function of size 1, a value function of size 2, whatever. There's just a, as a function of those types. And this you can think of as expected value. If it's, if it's random, this could be deterministic if it's a fixed algorithm. Right? There's just a function that's out there. So is that, uh, is that like a functional value? Just to say, you know, because like you have, you have, you have distributions. But in some ways, like their performance is like conditional on their performance relative to some task, which might be. Uh, this is this is a, no, so this is this is a task. Okay. So this is just basically saying for any so whatever goes. So we're saying who knows what goes on, right? There's just a set of types of people. And they could it could be dynamic. They could feed it each other. Anything that happens, but it is the case that given any set of people on this of size k on this task, they're going to get an expected value. That's it. And then the question is, what would have to be true of v? for there to be a test, right? OK, so it turns out you can decide, you can write down the homogeneous value of type C equals the value of a team of only me, like a team of James or a team of Scott, so a team of right, Jacobs. So instead of thinking of my individual ability, you could say, what's my homogeneous team ability, right? People use this to argue that LeBron James is better than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, right? Because they say, like, five LeBrons would beat five Kareems, okay? That's the end. And five LeBrons would beat five Steph Currys. And five Caitlin Clarks would beat five Angel Reese's. This was in my feed just this morning. Um, asking if I wanted to chime in on that based on this paper. But no, I would prefer not to. Okay, so, so now you could say there's an ordering that's induced by k, if I'm fixing teams of size k. But there also could be like a general ordering. If there were an ordering of people for any size group, right, then there'd be a full ordering. So now, any test of size k for a, any hiring hunter, if there is a test, um, oh, come on, why isn't this coming out? There we go. Uh, oh, so if there is a test for a team of size k, it's equivalent to h of k. Let me say this in less technical terms. If there is a hiring criteria test, it must be equivalent to homogeneous team value. So this is really wild. So all those other examples I gave you, like, oh, is this a test? Is this a test? Here's a test. We came up with this one. If there's a test, this is a test. It's the only thing you have to check for all those examples. If there's a test that you can apply to people, like this is letting people into graduate schools, picking a basketball team, doing a crew team, anything, if there's a test, this is the test. It's equivalent to this. Now, and the reason we say, why, why, is it, why, is, I mean, why are we using equivalent? Because in ordinal settings, as opposed to cardinal settings, right, you could actually have a different function. Like, there's examples where the, this is not the test, but they're ordinal. But then when you go and do it, it turns out that it's ordinally equivalent to this test. Right? The rankings of people ends up being the same. So this is the only possible test. But then you think, so what? How could you? <laughs> that still doesn't tell us when the test exists. It just says, it just got a lot easier, though. This is the only thing I got to check. So then it turns out that this is the necessary and sufficient condition. A hiring criterion exists if and only if replacing the lowest ranked member of a team with someone higher ranked improved team's performance. Yeah. Yeah, I'm confused about what you mean by a test. I mean, you can imagine all kinds of things. Like, for example, you could take a team and you could try them out for six months. Right. And would, that, that, would that count as a test? No, a test over individuals. So I'm asking, the question is, is there a test over individuals? So you could, you could take that person for 20 years. You could, you could look at them for 20 years, and if you gave each one a score. Yeah. So this, but let, let's stop for a second. This is a, this is a great point. Universities hire people. Google gets 3 million applicants. Everybody, like, everybody talks about a meritocracy in terms of like, you know, it's fairness. I was just, I'm better than someone else. This basically says, no. <laughs> there basically is no, I mean, well, when we look at the next thing, it's incredibly unlikely that there would be a test. So the idea that you could score people and rank them, and then your best team would be the best people, is really unlikely. And then, but this says, that's flawed. Even thinking that way is completely wrong. 
Instead, you should say, how good are you is how good would a team of you do? Right? No, it's, no, no, this is, well, I'm just saying, if there, no, we're going to see that there almost never is a test when you get to the next slide. There almost never, so the point is, there almost never is a test, right? But if there is a test, this is what the test has to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, phrase it in a slightly different way, but please sure. feel free to shut me, shut me down. So think of it from some kind of information perspective, right? So each person in the team, yeah. by measuring the space of the, the problem space, yeah. contributes or reveals some amount of information. Sure. So an individual test is something that's designed to score how much information they can extract. Right. But what you're interested in is not in that. In that, you're interested in how much information given the rest of the team can be. Exactly. Yeah, that's why there's no test. And and so your point is that indeed that that for instance, if you take experts, which are super superb, it could be that their training has conditioned them to converge <laughs> to a particular extraction of things. Right. In such a way that adding another expert is just in revealing no more relative information compared to the existing team. Uh, my friendly amendment would be like that, that there's many types of experts. So this is a thing like, right, yeah, 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 right. So the thing is like, so when you have something like, we're the UN, we have all these people who like, we're Rhodes Scholars and we're coming in, they're all thinking, they all, you know, they all think the same way and having someone who has local knowledge who on their own might not know as much because they know different stuff. So this is, in some sense what I'm saying kind of here is, so what I'm trying to do here is the following. There are literally, when we saw those papers, there's thousands of papers written on diverse teams versus homogeneous teams that are empirical tests. There's hundreds of papers that are kind of like simple mathematical models trying to show like, okay, how do homogeneous teams do versus other teams? And then there's also all these tests like, oh, do higher ability teams do better? And like, do people with more citations do better? So this is just kind of say, okay, let's just step back for a second and say exactly, what, I mean, you said in the context of information, but let's just think about it more broadly. The problems are too hard for individuals. They're just too complex, they're too high dimensional, they're really difficult. We still though have this tendency to think, okay, the we want to hire really smart people, really good people. We should hire the best people. But the thing is, so, but that's committing kind of a logical flaw because you're sort of assuming the best people make the best team. So, that, so then the question we just ask is, when would it be the case? Could you ever come up with a test? And so what was funny, this is what's so funny though, is like there's hundreds, hundreds, easily dozens that we've found in papers where people are like, there's no test here, or here's the test here, or there's no test here, or here's the test here, right? And they talk about conjunctive task and disjunctive task and iterative task and all this sort of stuff. Essentially, that whole literature can be consumed right here. If there is a test, this is it. It's equivalent to this. That, so it's um, super simple. But the, but the question, this isn't really the thing that, um, this is the one that's kind of more important. When is it a test? Is there a necessary and sufficient condition? And here's what's, this is weird. This is what it turns out to be. A hiring criteria exists if and only if replacing the worst member on that team by someone higher value necessarily improves team performance. So you could have cases where, like, if I've got, like, someone of, I suppose I've got people ranked, and I've got someone who's ranked one, two, four, five, and six. It could be that if I replace this, um, they're one, two, three, five, and six. The, the, we'll get there, just, just let me get there. So, so I've got one, two, four, five, and six. If I replace this person, this is the ranking by homogeneous team performance. So now I've got, now I've got here's how you rank people, homogeneous team performance. That's, that's this slide. If there is a criteria for how good you are, this is the criteria, right? This is the only possible criteria. So now I rank people by criteria and I say, when, if I'm ranking people by this criteria, does that actually work? Now it turns out there could be cases where when I replace this four with someone who's a three, that the team actually does worse, yet there's still a hiring criteria, right? But what can happen is if I replace this six with a four, the team has to do better. So the necessary and efficient condition is if you dump the lowest ranked person by homogeneous team performance, the team always does better, then there's a test. This is almost like separability. So like, let's go back to the first example. Like if we're running a relay race or chopping down trees, that's satisfied. But otherwise, kind of no. What if you don't replace, just cross six? Well, then this, this then depends on what the value function. Yeah, no, we didn't do that. We didn't do, there's probably a whole other set of theorems about like kind of team size. But this was just an attempt to try to like just do a simple kind of like, um, you know, kind of axiomatic, very general type space, kind of what 
results that are, and one of the things is there's a result from, famous result from mechanism design that says, if you're looking for economic mechanisms, you only need to look at kind of direct mechanisms. This is, I think, you know, what I, I think this actually has practical value because you could say to someone, um, you could just say to someone, look, if you really think this test is giving you the best teams, it isn't. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, no, this would have to be true. Like, you, you, it's really got to be separable. Yeah. Okay, but th I mean, there's some mathematical assumptions on, on this. Yeah, theory, almost right? none. I mean, That's I mean, the weird thing. This is like. No, but I mean, I mean, you, I, I mean, I think, is it fair to say that one way of thinking about this is you're characterizing the space of value functions and only a very, very small very, yeah. number of them have this characteristic yeah. where you can do this yeah. test. So the only assumptions I'm making is you can identify people by type and that there's some function that maps sets of types into values. So give me any set. Like, so it might be hard to come up with what this is, but there's just a way. If you gave me here's the set of people and there's a value from that set of people, which is, I mean, these things are always going to be true, right? There's always some way to describe people and there's always some mapping from those descriptions to performance. Now, there could be path dependence, so you could, in group dynamics and stuff, you could just take expected value. But the point is, like, these are the only, there's no convexity assumptions, nothing. There's no assumptions. It's just that there's types and value functions. So what we're saying is the set of, in the space of all, obviously, in the space of all value functions, anything is tiny. Yeah. Well, but it, can anything in an abstract sense would fit into this framework? Like we can, we classify our employees by types. We've got where they went to school, we've got what experience they've had, they've got their grade point average, we gave them a test, we've got like, they're represented by some vector in our yeah, HR. It's a, ve it's a vector of characteristics, or it could be like a, a, a type of some sort, right? I mean, but you could define these types anyway. They could be, these could be broad categorizations or loose categorizations, right? I mean, how well do they do on this task, right? So it could be like that box packing task, right? Again, you don't, I guess the thing is that you don't, you don't you're probably not going to know that V, but the reality is, is like, one thing I, I kind of find very useful about this is it just really makes it hard to think that like ranking people for hiring could make any sense. You know, and James can talk about this in more detail in some of his work. Like, I mean, we are putting together research teams. You don't, it's not like, let's get the smartest people. You really want to have diversity. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if there's any, like, experimental verification. Or, like, I'm struggling to think of a test that lets you collaborate with yourself. Has there been any attempt to implement uh, these kind of findings? And well, so let's go back to all those early studies I showed you before, right, which are showing diverse teams do best and yeah. kind of diverse teams do worse. So right. I've been the type of problem solver, not necessarily, like, Recording yourself one day and having you work with your. Uh, I'm just trying to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so it is. It's that. So you want to think of this really as kind of like if I had problem solvers who were very similar. Yeah. So again, this is a thought experiment. So as a thought experiment, the only way there'd be a test would be if this is true. And then if you make some continuity assumptions, here you have to make more assumptions. If I have a bunch of people who are very similar in. Uh, say I was <laughs> hypothetically running a company, there's not a, a sort of test that I could implement in hiring practices that would gauge your ability to collaborate with yourself for a very similar problem solving. This is where, you know, so we've, Anita and I have talked about this a great deal, like the eyes and the mind test, right? Like if, if you score poorly on the eyes and the mind test, a team of you would do terribly, right? Because you wouldn't, like the fact that you're nodding your head, I'm like, oh, he understands what I just said. I'd be like, why don't I, like, that guy's a twitch, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, so if you remember the same person, I thought, we couldn't read, I couldn't read your mind, I'm like, yeah, he does this weird thing with his head all the time, right? Um, whereas, like, when you go like this, oh, he, he understood me, right? So, so you and I, if we're the same type, we could figure out, oh, that would work for me. So two ways to think about this. One is to say, if there were a test, that's what that test would have to be. But the more important thing is probably not a test, right? And so you really want to... Yeah, and, but, well, but no, but if you go back to the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies of groups, what do you find? The best teams are diverse, the worst teams are diverse. You don't find the homogeneous teams winning. And presumably, a lot of those homogeneous teams were teams that were hired by some, you know, every company I go to, the, and every, it's not to some government agencies, but it's a lot of them, they're like, we're getting only the best people. Right? Which, of course, can't be true. But even if they are, even if they are getting the best people matching for their problem, that's a bad idea. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, one way of thinking about, like, so 
There's a, there's a great PNAS paper on assortative mating that shows that the if you look at the genes of basically yeah. it's a sample of like 40,000 right. like plausibly coupled individuals in like the basically the Hispanic right. Houston marriage market, that the, the most positively um, assorted uh, genetics are associated with complex facial uh, oh, right. mu musculature. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, who are you interacting with? People who look like you, A, yeah. you know, and B, who basically make the same twitches that you make. Right. right, which is to say that you're actually able to interpret their twitches in the yeah, same yeah, yeah. way which you can interpret your own twitches. So it's uh, anyway, so, so, so that I, I, you know, so in some sense, persistent couples end up looking like an experiment of oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That you select. Them. Yeah, no. Let, let also, there's no dynamics here as well, right? Like if, one of the things that has been found by Brian Uzi's found, but other people have found as well is if you have people work together for a long time. They start thinking together the same way, representing problems the same way, learning the same tools, and they don't do as well. So you, you want to constantly be churning teams. I was just a, like, and this is true of big project teams. So if you have people like, um, whether it's Broadway shows or military contractors or people who have bridges, they make sure they switch their upper management teams from one project to the next because otherwise they make the same, like the Go example, they make the same well, mistake. Uh, yeah. I worked in a very well-run company, and we had a research group. Yeah. And uh, the question is, what is diversity? So, yeah. backgrounds of all people were different, but everyone was very good at what they were doing. Yeah. And it worked extremely well. No, so, 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 diversity is there. It's very important. Right. Because people don't think the same way. But it depends on your definition what diversity Absolutely. Is. No, and, that, and that's where the, you saw that demographic. Like, the job, again, it totally depends on the test. There's some tasks where what your past work experiences are matter a lot, and there's other things we don't. Let me just let me get to just two other things. I wanted to get to people, some people want to talk about um, how culture and soft stuff plays in there, but just some very simple things. Like if you have cohort complements, so A and B, there's a cohort of teams such as having an A and a B together outperforms teams consisting with two A's and two B's. If there's things like that, like complementarity, you can't have a test, right? Um, there's this idea of like kind of structural holes where like. I'm a, a game theorist who studies political science, so I can talk to economists and game theorists. If you have structural holes and you kind of take the mathematical representation of structural holes, again, which there's a lot of evidence that these exist for firms, then there's no test. Right? So if you took any sort of complementarities, any, a lot of stuff that's been found empirically to be true would rule out the possibility of there being a test. Now, there is a question of like the orchestra problem. So if, it, if you can break the team down into a set of roles and each role has several members, right? then you can have a test for roles if there's no complementarities across the roles, right? So, so it, there is, it's not to rule this out, right? So if, um, a friend of mine who uh, writes books on basketball, Emily wrote this book called Basketball on Paper, and now he's got a new book, jokingly, he calls Basketball on Paper 2, but it's, I call it Basketball on iPod, iPad. Um, he, uh, <laughs> you know, this is a big question. Like, if you're, like for baseball, it does appear on people, Question this some, but there's a nice paper um, by Adam Glinski on baseball. It does look like you can kind of pick by role. Um, not quite to, though, because you don't want, if you have one super fast center fielder, you can get by with slower power hitting right fielder because that person will cover more ground. So there, it's not quite true. Okay. I want to get to this thing, though, where, I'm, where we're kind of moving next on this. And what's interesting, and part of the reason I moved into a business school is Michigan's got a tremendous business school, as does. UCLA, it just turns out, thinking about the sort of softer stuff, the team dynamics, how do you read people's faces, that sort of stuff, and I thought, I need, and culture. And so you can imagine, the other thing that's left out of here is, how are we doing this? Is this done in a market? Is it in a hierarchy? Is it in a democracy? And what are the cultural attributes of people? So I want to give you two very simple models and then one very interesting picture. So here's a very simple model of markets and trust. So there's people who come up with opportunities, like James gets an idea, I get an idea and I pass it to James, James is a doer, and he multiplies this by some value. So this is trust, you can think of it as reflective trust, you can think of it as calculated trust, you can think of it as kind of a normative trust. I'm just gonna um, distinguish between trust is actually taking the risk, trustworthiness is actually exhibiting that the trust made sense, okay? So here's the game, and this is a variance of the Joyce Berg's trust game. So there's this opportunity, it's got a value theta, I can keep it myself and keep theta, or I can give it to James. If I get to James, he makes it four times as big. But then there's a norm, he's gonna either return, he's gonna return half and keep half, or he could just keep it all. So I gotta decide, do I trust him? 
right? Now, what you can think of is, if I look at the proportion of markets, which is how many of those theta he does, and I model this as a repeated game, what you can get is, is that if, if we're like 80% markets, I should trust him for all theta. So this is like the percentage of times I'm trusting him, how many times should I trust him? Because the more I'm trusting him, the more kind of, if this is happening every single day, every day as an opportunity, you get this kind of convexity of trust. If I look at kind of as a function of the trust threshold, how many markets should I choose, that ends up being linear. And so if I graph these things on each other, what I get, trust production has to equal kind of the, the institutional choice, like which institution would I choose, and I get kind of two equilibria here, right? I get one that's high trust all markets, one that's low trust no markets, right? So what you get is even though, and so this is where the soft stuff sort of matters, if I started out in a low trust environment, the dynamics could lead me to no one having any trust. Okay, that's pretty straightforward and super fast. Here's one that I'm gonna slow down a bit on because it's I think more interesting. Let's suppose there's a three person organization, and this will relate more to what we're just doing, and there's a flow of ideas, right? Decisions that come in. Now, I can just make a decision, or we can decide by majority rule, and we're gonna assume that if we decide by majority rule, we get it right, right? And we're gonna assume each decision has some sort of predictability, and by, by predictability, what I mean is how well I know, right, how the other two people would vote on this. So I know that you're an economist, I know you're an anthropologist, and I'm a political scientist or something, and so I, I kind of can figure out what you guys would think, and so I kind of get it right. So the decision arrives, I can either, I can deliberate and get the correct vote at some cost W, or I can decide by myself, okay? Okay, come on. Now, here's what happens. I should decide by myself if the predictability, like if I can figure out what the other people are thinking, is bigger than this kind of one, my, this requires a lot of math, but basically there's just this threshold of whether I should decide by myself or um, go. But I also wanna make this other assumption. There's some level of knowledge I have of other people that affects the predictability. And the level of knowledge depends on how often we deliberate. Let me say this slowly, this is kind of subtle. If we never deliberate, this is zero, so that means the predictability is just the baseline predictability. But if we deliberated all the time, eventually I figure out how you think, and I figure out how you think, and I can kind of get it exactly right. But now there's this paradox of deliberation. The more I deliberate, the less I need to deliberate, because I know how these people think. So now I can think, okay, here's the kind of percentage of deliberation and then here's the accuracy that I've got. That's increasing linearly, right? But this is kind of tricky. Notice the axis is flipped. If my accuracy parameter were zero, so I was doing no deliberation, I would want to deliberate a lot. So if accuracy is low, I want to deliberate a lot. If accuracy is high, I never want to deliberate, right? Because I know what other people think. So, now I can kind of get, oh, here's this kind of like cultural institutional equilibrium where I've got, this is the proportion of the times I deliberate, and here's kind of how much I know about the other people. Isn't that wonderful? No, because it's inefficient. <laughs> and the reason it's inefficient is because if we deliberated more, right, it would be right, more accurate in all these other cases. Well, here's what's, I mean, there's a giant literature in organizational theory on cultural structural task alignment. And the idea is you want your structure and your culture to align. This suggests, wait, alignment has nothing to do with efficiency. Because culture and structure, there's, there's the culture you're producing and there's the culture you're using. And the only way to have efficiency is if those two are, those margins were equal. So let me do the Kandinsky version of this and we'll stop. Here's the Kandinsky version and you'll see why in a second. Let's suppose I've got three types of institutions now, markets, hierarchies, and democracies. And um, civic capacity is gonna be kind of how specialized my knowledge is and how other regarding I am. So the culture is just kind of do I have specialized knowledge and my other regarding. And now what I can do is I can um, think about, here's the level of specialization, here's the level of other regarding, and this is how we leverage that cultural and civic capacity. So up here, for really other regarding, and we're not very specialized, democracies work best, then hierarchies, and then markets. If I'm down here, but it's a really specialized, not very other regarding, so I've got specialized knowledge, I don't care about anybody but myself, I'm an economist. 
markets work best and democracies work worst, right? So this is kind of like which institution would work best on kind of an arbitrary task given that cultural mapping, right? So that's how do these institutions love it. However, if I had all markets, I would create completely selfish, specialized people, <laughs> right? If I had all democracies, I'd create really other regarding people who are somewhat specialized. And let's assume for the moment, if I had hierarchies, people are going to be specialized and, and also fairly other regarding. So this is, in this space here, would be if I had mostly democracies, some hierarchies, and very few markets, this is where my culture would end up. Right? Okay. So this is just basically saying, as a function of the institutions, what culture do I get? This is as a function of my culture, what institutions do I get? And so now I can go Kandinsky here, right, and sort of say equilibria would be cases where, so here this would have four different equilibria kind of sets. The only possible equilibrium, like so one is up here where I've got, or down here where I've got mostly markets, and my culture is mostly specialization. Up here, my culture is highly other regarding and mostly democracy. So what you get is that there, this value suddenly get there could be path dependence, and there's this interplay between kind of like the culture and the institutions. But again, there's no reason to think that you would have efficiency here. And so like in this, so here's one where markets actually, I, I'm um, not calling this other regarding anymore. I suppose markets create the thing up here and democracies create the thing down here. I get this single stable thing, but it's not efficient. And I also could have institutions that are really good at leveraging culture, but don't produce it. And that's going to be just wildly inefficient, right? But, but let me think about, let me just point out how this is going to happen. How this is going to happen is like, we're going to say, well, we're just really good at using a hierarchy to solve this. Like, my university does this. Like, we have a problem, let's form a committee, right? And we're just really good at doing that. But then the committee creates not necessarily a great culture, right? And then we can't leverage, you know, so we're not creating specialization, we're not creating other regarding preferences, and so we have nothing to leverage, right? And so you end up in a really kind of bad space. Okay. So quick summary. The beginning was absolutely all, there's tons and tons and tons of empirical studies showing that diversity is necessary, right? Which means that like it kind of shouldn't make sense that like hiring the best can't make sense. So then this was just kind of, a, I just thought it would be fun to show you this kind of like range of all these different models that people have to try and understand where diversity works. And then to say there's a very general theorem that just basically says, there probably isn't a test, right? And then the other thing is, I think that it's it's really fascinating when you, especially for this group, when we think about like how well a collective does. The, for humans, the structure of interaction is going to matter a lot, and the culture is going to matter a lot. But a lot of the empirical work in the setting is just kind of like taking those things as fixed, not thinking of them, you know, through like a, a com more of a complex systems lens where the structure obviously affects the culture, the culture obviously affects the structure, and if that's the case you'd have to have a tremendous foresight to have efficiency because you'd have to be choosing inefficient ways of doing things to make sure you're pulling the culture in the right way, right? So you'd have to deliberate more than you'd want to, right? Like, think, oh my God, I can't believe we're deliberating about this. But you're doing so because, you know, people are gathering, you know, knowledge about other people. All right, so let me stop there. We have negative one minute for questions. <laughs>